Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Behold, the hire of the laborers who have reaped down your fields, which is of you kept back by fraud, crieth. And the cries of them which have reaped are entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Ye have lived in pleasure on the earth and been wanton. Ye have nourished your hearts as in a day of slaughter. Ye have condemned and killed the just, and he doth not resist you. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he received the early and latter rain. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath. But let your yea be yea, and your nay nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. Is any among you afflicted, let him pray. Is any merry, let him sing songs. Is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another, that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth, and one convert him, let him know that he which converteth the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death, and shall hide a multitude of sin. Hello and welcome everybody to our next reading of the Divine Program of the World's History. Today is a beautiful Sabbath Saturday, June 1st, 2019, and my oh my, that day just keeps going faster and faster, it seems, and we are well into the second portion of the book, halfway, past the halfway marker here, and we are going to start in some very interesting European history, and I think last time, Yerk, I was there at my mom's house in the garage out in the cool air, and just look, looking over the field there. It was such a nice place. Yeah, I like to go visit mom every once in a while. That's a good thing to do. Yeah, I saw the pictures and the nice movie you made from walking around there. It's... Yeah. Yeah, maybe I put that in the intro just for the fun of it. Yeah, why not? Why not? So, uh, yeah, we are on page 114, Yerk. At the top of the page, are we? Yes, we are on the top of the page of the book, 114 in the book and 101 in the PDF. We just read about the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, and now we are reading about what follows that, and that is, of course, the great exodus from France that happened in 1685. We are speaking about the great exodus of the Huguenots, who, because of the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, now were free to be persecuted by everyone, 
and therefore they fled France, and they fled not with hundreds or thousands, but with hundreds of thousands, and other hundreds of thousands were killed. So let's see what the author says, because this is interesting. I had a half an hour time or something and read a little bit on beforehand the next few pages, and it's going to be very interesting what we are going to read here today. So the great exodus from France in A.D. 1685. Then followed the great exodus. Nothing could arrest it. Thousands on thousands of Huguenots fled from France. The frontiers were guarded in vain. Disguised in all manner of ways, their faces disfigured, their garments rent in the darkness of night by sequestered path through forests, across mountains, and over the sea in open boats, they fled, and still fled, until half a million had escaped. They fled to Switzerland, they fled to Holland, to England, and to other countries. 400,000 more perished in the effort to escape. The prisons were crowded, the houses of the Huguenots emptied and their homes left tenantless. Thousands of those who were captured in attempting to escape were chained to the horrible galleys, crammed into filthy jails, brutally beaten and bastinadoed by their captors, or broken on the wheel. Still, they remained faithful. Now, I had to look up the word bastinadoed to understand what it is. Do you Are you familiar with that word, Brad? Ah, um, vaguely, yes. Okay, vaguely. So, I'm going to explain what it is. I looked it up in Wikipedia, and it says, it is foot whipping. F- foot whipping or mm. bastinado is a method of corporal, means, uh, yeah, punishment of the body, which consists of hitting the soles of a person's bare feet. Unlike most types of flogging, the pun- this punishment was meant to be more painful than it was to cause actual injury to the victims. Blows were generally delivered with a light rod, knotted cord or a lash. The receiving person is required to be barefoot. The uncovered soles of the feet need to be placed in an exposed position. The beating is typically performed with an object in the type of a cane or switch. The strokes are usually aimed at the arches of the feet and repeated a certain number of times. And I have here the Wikipedia article still open, so you see here are the feet exposed that the lashing can begin. Here we have another picture of the bastinado. This is corporal punishment, yeah, with a whip. The person is struck to be punished for whatever they think punishment is necessary. And here you have another picture of this, and I guess that you can imagine that it is not such a nice feeling when you are the one that is laying there and receiving the strokes from the ball, or how do you call this guy? Or look at this, doesn't look very pleasant to me. And this is how the Antichrist system always works with the people who defend the truth of Jesus Christ. So these are the pictures, and this is the article I took it from. So when you um, type in bastinado, you will be redirected here, and then you can have a read on this and read about the history about it. It's just a shame that you can read about this thing and next time when you're out on the streets you will meet those people who love to do this just to you, you know, because that's the world that we're living in. Nothing has changed between the end here of the 17th century and the beginning of the 21st where we live, where we live today, eh, Brett? No, Nothing not much. Nothing has changed, no. There mm-hmm. are still... Roman Catholics out there, and the problem is that there are even more Roman Catholics out there today than there were in that time. And they all hate Jesus Christ, and they all hate Jesus Christ professing Christians like Brett and me, and maybe even you. The beginning of the end of the papal power, this was, the author says. He says, by this one great persecution alone, France lost nearly a million of her best Protestant citizens. Why did they lose their best Protestant citizens? Well, because these Protestants were wonderful 
merchants not only, but they were craftsmen most and for all. Yeah, they were um, they were uh, they were carpenters, uh, they were smiths, they were bakers. They were the ones working with their hand and really did good craft. And all these uh, this knowledge, of course, all of a sudden was lost for France. So you can imagine that not only by killing 400,000 of these protestant Huguenots, but losing another at least 400,000 through um, their escape from the country, that the economy of France must have taken a very, very strong whip. I mean, imagine that in the United States of America, more than half of the people who are craftsmen all of a sudden shut down their work. What are you left with in that country? Huh? You got nothing anymore. That's what it was with France at that time, on the end of the 17th century. So, that's why they lost uh, her best Protestant citizens. This was the beginning of the end of papal supremacy in Rome. Yeah, you know, we have had, had already the beginning and the starting of the Reformation, beginning of the 16th century. Now we are here on the 17th century and it just goes on and on. The papacy is getting one whip after the other. And the, papal of persecu and the end of papal persecution on any wildly extended scale in the world. It was the beginning of a new era. The revocation of the Edict of Nantes took place on October 17, 1685. The English Revolution followed three years later, and William of Orange and Mary were crowned in April 1689. Now, this Queen Mary is the one that I didn't understand quite correctly when I started reading the book from Philip von Limborch, History of the Inquisition. I told you that I'm reading this, and still going probably to continue on my second YouTube channel, reading that book. And in the beginning there's a, a dedication to the Queen Mary. I didn't understand who that was. And that was the Queen Mary who more or less abdicated her throne and gave the reins to her husband, who was William of Orange, who came over from the Netherlands and reigned in England. William of Orange was the King of England. It was in the straight um, succession line, it was Mary, but Mary didn't want to reign, so he gave the re she gave the reins to her husband, William of Orange. We are going to read a little bit more on that a little bit later. In 1690, papal power in Britain was crippled by the papal overthrow at the Battle of the Boyne. From this time onward, Protestant power rose higher and higher in the world, whilst papal power sank lower and lower, except as a subtle mischief-making influence amongst nations. 1685 AD The Jesuits and the various Roman Catholic quote-unquote truth societies frequently attempted to shield the Church of Rome from the guilt of these awful massacres of Huguenots by asserting that they were political rebels and that religion had little or nothing at all to do with the question. <laughs> this is the story Rome always tells. The medal struck by the King of France at the time, and now in the British Museum, tell a completely different story, as will be seen by examining the inscription on each. Now, these medals were struck in France 1685. Did you prepare a better picture of these, uh, Brad? I only found one uh, that's there in the chat, and okay. uh, I was looking for the other, and I haven't found it yet. Okay, so but you have this one. This is uh, yeah. This is the first one here, right? Mm -hmm. Where she holds up the cross. Yeah, this is the one mm -hmm. heresy extinguished, as the comment says. Yeah. Ah, uh, actually, it's different, Yerk. Heretics. It's even different. It, it's almost the same, but um, this is like more of a close-up. Yeah, because here you have the whole building on behind. Yeah. Them. That is uh, St. Peter's Square, I think. Yeah, and St. Peter's Dome in Rome, and the woman standing on Ooh. the conquered Huguenot. Yeah. Or is it? Or is it the? Um, boy, what's that called again? Their um, pantheon. Uh, no, uh, the other, the other holy place, so-called holy place of the Roman Catholic Church, uh, the Lateran Church. Oh, Eric. that's that's possible. 
That's possible. possible too, because it still has those statues on the top there. It, it, it seems that this is a different picture from the one that here in the book, because here you have something on the side, and this is a total front view, and this what you are sending mm. is, is more a, a side view here and a back view. So this is another one, but the text is the same. It says "extincta heresis," means heresy is extinct. Yeah. Ah, got it. So Except the text, it's backwards on the, <laughs> the text is the same as you see. Heresies extinct, extinguished. Yeah. Right. Heresies extinct. Yeah. yeah. As you can see it gotcha. here, it's the same here in this picture, but the background is a little bit different. Holding up the cross, and of course we know who this is. Yeah. yeah. This is the Queen of Heaven of the Roman Catholic Church, of course, and this is a Bible-believing, Sabbath-keeping Huguenot. Okay. Thank you for that picture, Brad. It's always nice You're to welcome. have these pictures on here. And nice that you could have found it so fast during our I'll see if session. I can find another, and I'll, I'll, I'll let you know if I do. Okay. But we already have this one. Yeah, it's so good enough. Our, yes. our viewers have the possibility to have a good look at this one now. Now, these medals were struck by the King of France in honor, quote-unquote, we should actually say honor, of the revocation of the Edict of Nantes in 1685 AD. It will be observed that heresy and not political rebellion was the crime for which the Huguenots were expelled. It says so on the coins. Heresis extincta. Heresy, not political terrorism or whatever. Huh? The coins more speak more truth than the Jesuitical history. But this is something the author will tell us probably a few paragraphs later. I read that. It will be observed that heresy and not political rebellion was the crime for which the Huguenots were expelled. The testimony of contemporary medals are more reliable than Jesuit libraries of quote-unquote rewritten history. See, this is the sentence that I just meant. One year later, 1686 AD, the Waldensians were expelled from their valleys by the Romish persecutors. They flee to Switzerland and to other countries. 11,000 men, women and children perish. The immortal Arnaud accomplishes the glorious return, which the French expression is la rentrée glorieuse, means the glorious re-entry, if you translate that into English. The immortal Arnaud accomplishes the glorious return to, of the exiled Waldensians to their Alpine homes. Now, this is a nice story we are going to read right now. When they started out, they were very poorly armed, owing to their poverty. As they approached their beloved valleys, a spy met them and offered to guide them to a spot where friends were encamped and waiting to welcome them. But the spy led them instead into the camp of their enemies. When they saw that they had been betrayed, Arnaud gave the order to charge, and the fury of the charge carried everything before them. The Piemontese enemies threw away their arms and fled for their lives. Arnaud and his men sat down to the supper the enemy had prepared for themselves. Rearmed and fed with the captured enemy supplies, Arnaud and his heroes went on their way rejoicing. They set out from Switzerland, August 16, 1689, and succeeded after a desperate nine-month struggle. Miraculously fed amidst snow-covered mountains by discovery of standing corn buried under the snow. Imagine this. This is how God works for his people. Their Roman Catholic supplanters had sown the fields, but winter had that year set in earlier than usual and buried their crops of corn deep in the snow. When Arnaud and his 700 vaudois reached their beloved Valdensian valleys, they were hemmed in by the Piedmontese armies sent against them and were in despair for food. But on digging up the snow whilst throwing up an entrenchment, they found that their Heavenly Father had known their need before they even left Switzerland and unknown to them had stored up corn and wheat in plenty all round their little encampment. Such a communion service as they celebrated on the spot on those alpine heights, chanting the palms to the clash of arms, the glory of the Lord shone round the camp. Napoleon 
when he was in Turin, 1805, respectfully accosted the Reverend Peirani, a vaudois pastor, with the question, Is our notes rentré glorieuse or glorious re-entry? Is that story true? Yes, sire, was the reply. We believe God Almighty helped us. You, responded Napoleon Bonaparte, are a brave people, was the emperor's rejoinder. Napoleon, who knew their history, had exempted them from contributing to the Italian war indemnity. Their heroism for centuries had won his hard heart. Even a high-level Freemason, 33rd degree Freemason, like Napoleon Bonaparte, had, have, has had warm feelings for the Waldensians that have been persecuted by the Roman Catholic Church throughout histories, and when he got confirmation that this history of Arnaud was true, it filled his heart with joy unspeakable. <sighs> Reminds a little bit with this hardened heart uh, on Pharaoh, right? Who kept hmm. Israel in captive all the time, but who had not softened his heart. But here we can see that Napoleon has really had some feelings for the Vaudois or Valdensians, as they are called. Any comments there, brother? Well, probably had some friends. You know, it's interesting, you know, the wheat and the tares, they grow together. And, you know, there are instances, you know, where you're in a work situation, you work right alongside your uh, counterparts that share uh, the same uh, community but have uh, much different faith. And, um, yeah, who knows? To me, anyway, it was to read this a heartwarming little part yes. to understand that the heroism of the Waldensians for centuries had won his hard heart of Napoleon. Now, continuing in the history, 1688, we come to the English Revolution. James II, a secret Roman Catholic, and the Jesuits strive to subvert civil and religious liberty in England and to restore the ascendancy of the Church of Rome. Roman Catholics are in full patronage. Judge Jeffreys was holding his quote-unquote bloody assize. In the army, Protestant officers were replaced by Roman Catholics. The papal nuncio, that is the highest papal representative in any country, was received at Windsor by the king, and the seven Protestant bishops of the Church of England were sent to the Tower of London amidst the tears and prayers of the people. The darkness before the dawn has just come over England. James II, the last Roman Catholic king of England, abandons his throne and flees from the country into England, uh, into France. Sorry. In 1689, now this is interesting now, William, Prince of Orange, who we have read a little bit earlier already over, is called by the English nation to its rescue, together with his wife, the Queen Mary, okay, in July 1688. Now, what day does he land in Torbay in England, on the shores of England? November 5th. Remember, remember, the 5th of November, the gunpowder plot, a day never to be forgot, eh? Mm. Joined by a large military force, he arrived in Torbay and wel was welcomed to London on December 20th, 1688. William and Mary were placed upon the throne on February 13th, 1689. James II lands at Kinsale on the 12th of March 1689, welcomed with transports by the Romanists. Siege and noble defence of Londonderry, 105 days. Garrison reduced from 7,000 7, effective men to about 3,000. Deliverance followed on the 28th of July. In 1690 AD we have the Battle of Boyne. Papal overthrow. Two Huguenot regiments fought side by side with the English forces against the papal army and swam 
the Boyne with the victors. 1694. The birth of Voltaire, nine years after the revocation of the Edict of Nantes. Voltaire's brilliant atheistical teaching rushed like a torrent into the void and vacuum created by the expulsion from France of the Gospel and the Huguenot Saints of God. So, you get rid of the Huguenots in France and what you get is a vacuum and in this vacuum comes the teaching of Voltaire who teaches Gnosticism. Huh? 1697, Peace of Ryswick. 15th of September 1697, a peace between Great Britain, the United Provinces, France, Spain and the Emperor Leopold I. Emperor is the Roman Emperor, of course, you have to understand it like this. And of sanguinary, sanguinary conflicts, mean bloody conflicts, and full establishment in England of civil and religious liberty. 1698, the year 1698 following the termination of the English Protestant Revolution, is the 1203 scores lunar year from the fall of the Western Roman Empire, A.D. 476. Now, Brett, I must tell you that I had no idea when we started reading this book that there are so many dates where you can measure biblical prophecy of a time, times, and half a time. Hmm. 1,203 score day years or 42 months or three and a half years on. It's always the same number coming back and coming back in solar years, coming back in lunar years, uh, in all kinds of years, in all kinds of forms. And every time it is when this happened, 1260 years back, this happened. This is just incredible how prophecy has so many fulfillments in this world. There's not only one fulfillment of this prophecy of the 1260 days, there is numerous fulfillments of this prophecy. This is what makes it so fantastic to live in our time when we try to make sense of our time today. Mm, this is true. Very true. Amazing. Uh, yeah, Yerk. Um I'm at a loss for words on this one. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. It's just yeah. the thing. It's just the thing that you. I, I don't mean you especially, Brett, but I mean sure. everybody no, no. Who, Everyone. who watches yeah. and listens to this. I should think about that. There is not one date we can say this and this was accomplished because when you go back a few pages, even we already read, we already read over uh, on other fulfillments of the 1260 day prophecy. And it's always the question, do you fill it with lunar years, with solar years, with calendar years? And what is the time of departure? And what is the time uh, after that? What is the fulfillment thereof? The fulfillment of this prophecy is multiple times. The three and a half years is, let's say, a time that very often points to the end of the reign of the Antichrist or part of the end. And when you have 10 different endings, small endings, then you get a bigger one. And when it all sums up in the end, you will see that the papacy comes out very, very much damaged. Even though the papacy and, and, and the Jesuits rule today, as we say over and over again in our broadcasts, we still have to understand that the power the papacy has is not that power. It is not an unchallenged power. Let's say it this way. It is not an unchallenged power. Even though they rule more or less here or there, we never ever should forget that our Father in Heaven still is in control and He holds all the strings in His hand. And the puppet that He holds also is also the Antichrist for a part. Satan has been given dominion and power over this world. But Satan can only do what God allows him to do. Don't ever forget that. And when we come to all these different fulfillments of Bible prophecy, don't you ever forget that he who knows the end from the beginning, he who wrote the history of this world before he even created it, is still in full absolute 100% control of it. And everything bad that happens only happens because people turn their back to God. 
That's an interesting message that you should understand. Why do so many atrocious and bad things happen to quote-unquote humanity? Because humanity has turned his back on God. Why should he care for someone who doesn't care for him? And since most of the world doesn't care for him, well, the world pays back. Right? Right. You reap what you sow. Now, let's continue. The year 1698, was that where I was? Ah, yeah. yeah. Following the termination of the English Protestant Revolution is the 1260th lunar year from the fall of the Western Roman Empire in AD 476. In 1700 AD, we get the Society of the Propagation of the Gospel in Foreign Parts, founded in AD 1701. Antichrist Pope Clement XI endeavors to establish the papal dominion in its former extent. The former extent means the time before the Reformation. In 1741, Whitfield and Wesley commence their labors. In 1746, widespread powerful evangelization in England and in North America acts as an antidote and afterwards prevents the French revolutionary contagion from gaining a foothold in these two countries. 1754. Voltaire, who was under the guise of Jesuits, of course, by his writings deluging France with infidelity and thus prepares the rising generation for the frightful atrocities of the Great Revolution, speaking of the French Revolution at the end of the 18th century. This is the starting of the Third Woe, the era of the seven vials that we read about in Revelation chapter 11 verse 14, read about in Revelation chapter 15, 16, 17 and 18, from the middle of the 18th century when Voltaire began to sow his infidel seed. In 1755 AD, general outbreak of continental infidelity, caused chiefly by the loss of all faith in Christianity because of the heathen Babylonish rites, the frightful wickedness practiced by cardinals, bishops and priests, and massacres committed in the name of Christianity by the Church of Rome. Now, this is one of the chief important sentences of all the book I have read so far, I must tell you. That at least is my understanding of hmm. this. What do you think of this, Brett? Isn't hmm. that a wonderful, interesting sentence that we just read here? Mm -hmm. General outbreak of continental infidelity. Uh, we, we remember in 1762, we have had this... Um, court case in France of Lavalette and the laying out in the open of the Moneta Secreta in France. Yeah? And wow. then the author says here caused chiefly by the loss of all faith in Christianity. So the people saw that Christianity as it is revealing itself to us in the book of God, in the Bible, has nothing to do with the heathen Babylonian rites of the Roman Catholic Church and the frightful wickedness that is practiced by the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church, speaking of the cardinals, the bishops and the priests, and all the massacres they committed in the name of Christianity. But they see that the Church of Rome is not Christianity. So I'm sorry the people in the 18th century here were so much smarter than 95% of the world's population today who just don't see that Roman, Catholic, Roman Catholicism is not Christianity. We come to the first vial that we read on in several, uh, Revelation chapter 16, verse 2, quote, There fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, i.e., the men who owned submission to papal Rome. Now, why did I, in green, highlight men which had the mark of the beast? Why are we always waiting today in the 21st century for the mark of the beast, when this is uh, <laughs> already long in working here, even in the 18th century? There already we have had the mark of the beast, and we had the men of the mark of the beast that were then 
a very grievous struck as we can read here with the vial, with the first vial right interesting yeah. yes it's not all in the quote unquote end times of the 21st century many things already started way before our time and i don't say that the mark of the beast is out of the world i just say listen it probably even started a few hundred years ago and still is working there's no timeline on that in the bible so we have to get rid of our idiotic um, conspiracy theories of oh the mark of the beast is an rfid chip yeah that's right yeah you're that's that's so true the point is that it is so difficult to take the spiritual wording of the bible and then to place it on something carnal here in this world because that's what people do mm -hmm. they read of a mark of the beast in the bible which is a spiritual thing because it's a spiritual book and they want to put something fleshly on and they say oh it is this or this or this or this and they don't understand that they have to use spiritual concernment and not only fleshly concernment so i think that the mark of the beast is an rfid chip is something that even the greatest idiot doesn't believe anymore today i think let's hope but let's you know think about what could it be but i personally do not care so much about what the mark of the beast is because i try to follow the lord jesus christ and i try to uphold his word and i try to uphold his law by following his law and being obedient to his law and with that i couldn't care less what the mark of the beast is because i don't think that i have the mark of the beast when i am a follower of jesus christ what about you brad thanks Jörg. yeah i think that's a very healthy attitude I think, you know, you give something too much attention and it gets out of proportion way too quickly. And, you know, these kind of arguments, what are they? Doubtful disputations, the Bible says, right, Yerk? Yeah, that's correct. And we're not supposed to engage in doubtful disputations. Um, rather, you know, we know what the beast is. And uh, so the mark of the beast is simply a uh, allegiance, I would say, to that. That's the way I look at it. It's pretty simple. It's not very complicated. When you act as the beast tells you. Mm -hmm. And when you think as the beast tells you to do. Yeah. That's right. There you go. And then you're much more susceptible to the mark of the beast, if you ask me. But that's just my take on it. You know, I think most people are just afraid to look at all the history because there's so much of it, Yerk. It's incredible. And because the only history that is taught the people, Brett, is the history yeah. of the Jesuits that they wrote. The it's not the real history. It's the yeah, corrupted the history. The Antichrist uh, wants us to know he wants us to know uh, all kinds of things that are contrary to the word of god and and then of course we engage in doubtful disputations and then oh all of a sudden you know uh yeah things get really twisted in all kind of realms everywhere you look i mean look at the world we live in today it's just it's just uh gut-wrenching sometimes yerk truly is so I'm going to continue then. Thank you. From the rise of the papal power connected with the decree of the Emperor Justinian, where we get the Justinian laws from, March AD 533 AD, constituting the Bishop of Rome, quote, head of all the holy churches, unquote. And we have to understand this, what Emperor Justinian did, was giving the uh, uh, constituting the power to the Bishop of Rome of all the Western Church. Yeah? Please keep that in mind because it was Emperor Phocas who gave the, uh, or who constituted the Bishop of Rome the head of all the churches, meaning Western and Eastern Church. That happened in 606 607. But Emperor Justin, uh, Justinian did that in 533, constituting the Bishop of Rome head of all the Holy Churches. Of course, all the holy churches that he had a say over, and those were the Eastern churches, to the first vial in AD 1755, so from 533 to 1755, there elapsed 1,203 score 
lunar years expired in September. After that, we read that the Jesuits were expelled from Portugal in 1759, France in 1764, that is after we had the court case of Lavalette that I just spoke about in 1762, with the laying out in the open of the Monita Secreta. The Jesuits were expelled from Spain after that in 1766 and 1768 by the King of Sicily, and in 1769 was the birth of Napoleon and Wellington. In 1773, the Jesuits abolished were abolished by Antichrist Pope Clement XIV on the insistent demand of the papal kings of Europe. In 1775, from the rise of papal power through the decree of Justinian, March AD 533, as we just read a little bit earlier here, to the accession of Antichrist Pius VI on February 15, 1775, the Pope whose temporal government was overthrown in the French Revolution, the interval is, you guessed it, 1,203 score calendar years, i.e., a time times and half a time, as we can read in Revelation chapter 12, verse mm. 14. In 1776, then, the United States of America declare their independence on July 4, 1776. In 1780, the Sunday School, and this is now very interesting in the upcoming two pages. In 1780, the Sunday School was founded by Robert Rakes of Gloucester. He was a proprietor of the Gloucester Journal. Cynics accused him of correcting his newspaper proofs on Sunday and asserted that he founded Sunday schools for the purpose of drawing the children from the streets where their noisy play interfered with his work. The Sunday schools of Rakes' generation trained the generation with which, uh, which within less than 30 years founded our great Bible and missionary societies at the close of the 18th and beginning of the 19th centuries. During the next 100 years the movement spread all over the globe and wherever Sunday schools have been established they have lifted the children and the nation onto a higher spiritual and moral plane and brought righteousness, happiness and they even brought prosperity. The word of God infuses life into the nations who teach it to their children. In the year 1910 AD, Sunday schools had been established in 126 countries, with a total of 285,900 schools, 2,607,371 teachers and officers, and 25,400,000 scholars or pupils. 66 countries, including various divisions of Africa, are still without any Sunday school. The criminal statistics of these countries are a striking testimony as to the value of the Sunday school in laying a foundation of truth and righteousness in the child life of a nation. According to Mulhall's Dictionary of Statistics and the Statement's Yearbook, the papal nations stand from 50 to 500 percent higher in crime than do the Protestant nations. 50 to 500 percent higher in crime. As previously mentioned, the murder statistics of the European nations show Britain the lowest and Italy, the home of Antichrist, the highest. Now let's go over these two little tablets that we have here. The first one is Sunday Schools in the World as of 1910. Here we we'll read the Grand Division. So the world here is divided in nine different parts. North America, Central America, South America, the West Indies, all of Europe, all of Asia, all of Africa, Malaysia and Oceania. We see that altogether we are speaking of the number of Sunday schools 236,789. But for example, when you have a little look, you see that Central America here only has 75 Sunday schools. 75. Mm. Whereas in Europe you have 33,823. 
75 schools for 4,237,000 inhabitants. Yeah, that's the population. And only 5,400 scholars, meaning pupils, and 471 teachers. So that's more than 100 uh, for every teacher, right? Mm -hmm. No, no, that's not. Mm -hmm. That's not true. That's uh, about 10. Very, very small classes, <laughs> indeed. But the point is, 75 Sunday schools for 4 million people, where, for example, you have 33,823 for 399 million, or let's say 400 million. Yeah? So that's even percent-wise many, many more in Europe than there for example, in Central America, or even when you see South America, not even 1,000 uh, 1, Sunday schools for 40 million inhabitants. Huh? And this, of course, when you see this table and uh, look at it quiet for yourself without me uh, giving all the comments, you can open this for yourself or you can stop the video here, pause the video and have a look at it for yourself. You see that it is quite though that where Rome rules, you have less schools and less educated people in the word of God. Now, this is worldwide, and here we come into the Sunday schools in Europe, including Great Britain and Ireland. Now, interesting is, as he says here, note how few Sunday schools are there in papal countries, such as France, Austria, Belgium, Italy, Spain, Portugal, and Ireland. Okay, so let's have a look. France. We have, uh, this is not colorly working, so France here. We have 1200 schools, 7000 teachers, 67,000 pupils for a population of almost 40 million. Huh? Belgium, we have 145 schools, 540 teachers for 7200 pupils for 7 million inhabitants. Bohemia, we have almost the same numbers. And then we have Italy, 372 schools for 32 million inhabitants. Portugal, 29 for 5 million inhabitants. Spain, 94 for almost 19 million inhabitants. Yeah. So we really see how few Sunday schools there are in papal countries. When you compare this to England and Wales, you have 44,000 schools for 32 million inhabitants. In France, you have even 1,200 for 38 million. That's much better. In Germany, you have 9,000 for 56 million. Yeah? Germany, for a big part, of course, was Roman Catholic, not forget. And here, in Russia, 884 schools for 106 million inhabitants. Huh? The most powerful, enlightened, progressive, philanthropic, happy and contented nations are those with the most Sunday schools. Eternity only can reveal how much the nations of the earth owe to the training of the children in the Sunday schools. It was Protestant Britain and North America which came to the help of Italy when Messina was destroyed by the earthquake. How much help did the papal nations send? Now this is the earthquake of Messina we are speaking out about I think in the 19th century. Now let me remind you, a few years ago, we are, having, we are writing today the year 2019. In 2006, on the 25th of December, we have had that awful tsunami in, uh, in the Philippines, I think it was. Mm. Yep. Hundreds of thousands of lives perished because of that tsunami. And where did all the help come from in those times? From America, from Germany, from England. Of course, from many other countries too. But the biggest part came from those protestant countries. Mm -hmm. They are there to help. 
And the region that was flooded in the Philippines was pagan and Roman Catholic. Okay? So the point the author makes here of the earthquake of Messina, that it was Britain and North America that came to the help of Italy at that time, is something that you can draw a line all through history, even until 2006, when you are dealing with the tsunami that happened in 2006. Now, we are coming to the era of the French Revolutionary Wars. And to understand this, we are going to read from Revelation chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. Now, I don't know if he has the King James Bible here. I didn't check that because he also um, mm. puts Let in some that. comments in there. So, did you, did you check that, Brett? Is that the King I'll James check Bible it right here? now as we're talking. I'm okay. looking it up right now. I'm starting to read to you anyway from Revelation chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. We read, And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your ways and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. And the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth. And there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. And the second angel poured out his vial upon the sea, and it became as the blood of a dead man, and every living soul died in the sea. And the third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and the fountains of waters, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the water say, Thou art righteous, O Lord, which art, and wast, and shall be, because thou hast judged thus. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given them blood to drink, for they are worthy. And I heard another out of the altar say, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun. And power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of God, with which had power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. Now are these the troubles of our own days, speaking of the beginning of the twentieth century? And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, or Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. And for they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and to the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches, keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air. And there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were voices, and thunders, and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake, and so great. And the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon came in remembrance before God, to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, for the plague thereof was exceeding great. 
Now, according to the views of our recognized standard interpreters of the prophetic scriptures of the historical school, very important that we understand this is the historical school, not futurist, not preterist, this is the historical school, our position chronologically at the present time in the great divine program set forth in the book of Revelation is approximately chapter 16, verse 12. That's where he uh, asked the questions. Are these the troubles for our own days on continuation on verse 12 here? The preceding verses in this chapter are generally regarded as referring to the era of the Great French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars, which grew out of it. Verse 2 is supposed to refer to the dreadful outbreak of social and moral evil which accompanied that great revolutionary movement. Verse 3 to the great naval wars which swept the navies of the papal countries of Europe off the sea during the same period. Verse 4, Napoleon's battles fought on the banks of the Alpine rivers and on those Italian, Austrian and German rivers fed by these mountain streams. These rivers were almost literally dried red with human blood during those campaigns. They had also, they had also been scenes of papal persecution. Verses 5, 6 and 7 inform us that this dreadful bloodshed was retribution on papal lands because of past persecutions of God's people. Verse 8, to the overturning of the thrones of Europe by Napoleon. Verse 10, to the plundering of Rome and dethronement of the Pope by the French in 1798-1809. to Rome was the seat of the beast. Verse 12, to the drying up of the Turkish Empire, yeah, we already read that on the Edict of um, Toleration from 1844 through 1919, as you probably remember, these 75 years. So in verse 12, we are dealing with the drying up of the Turkish Empire or the Ottoman Empire by the continuous breaking away of provinces. Since the year 1827, Greece, the Balkan provinces, Algeria and Egypt have all broken away from Turkey. During the 19th century, the Turkish Empire lost over half of its territory. In 1876, Turkey became bankrupt. Verses 13 through 21. To future tremendous social and political convulsions and probably to the times of trouble through which we are now passing in 1916 AD. In verse 15, there is a short, sharp warning to keep in the midst of these things a sharp lookout for the coming of Christ. So I guess that that is even more applicable today in 2019. The Battle of Armageddon mentioned in verse 16 is thought by many expositors to refer to an era of great wars rather than to a single great battle. See 1915, re-era 1915-1937 AD. Eliot interprets verse 19 as a possible prediction of the dividing of papal Europe into three parts instead of ten as, as at present by the coming Armageddon conflict. Possibly the fall of the cities of the nations, also prefigured in verse 19, may refer to some future overthrow of all law and order in all the cities of Europe by anarchist, socialist and revolutionary mobs. Now, this is going to be interesting to think about uh, the implications of this in 2019 today. Where here in Europe we have, like in Germany, we have had this author Udo Ulfkotte, who is now uh, dead, he passed away a year or two ago, who wrote a book that is called Civil War in Our Cities. And we have now the import of all the quote-unquote refugees from all over the world that are going to split the minds of the people here in Europe. Because many people just don't want to mingle with all the refugees. And all these refugees are mostly Islamic, Antichrist, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting to understand this little verse that we just read here in the understanding of 2019 over here in Europe. What is, What are the implications of that? That's something to think about and um, 
maybe we will have our brother Michael with us tomorrow. And when mm -hmm. when I'm gonna send him the recording we are doing today, maybe he has time to watch it and think about this, and he can contribute to our reading tomorrow. But I would like to stop here and then go further tomorrow with our next reading, Brett. If that's all right with you. Great. Yep. Perfect timing. Perfect timing. Yeah, that's uh, quite a lot to think about here. <laughs> Boy. Yeah, that's that's major. Major. And, you know, uh, I just had a busy week and, yeah, just uh, not as awake as I could be today. But uh, nonetheless, I greatly appreciate the reading, Yerk. I got interrupted by a phone call earlier in the first half mm -hmm. and it threw me off. And uh, But uh tried to recover a little bit here. <laughs> <laughs> I just didn't get enough sleep last night, you know. That's the problem here. I need to get enough sleep to, to be able to come up to speed here. I have no trouble carrying us through the reading, Brett. It's just for you to Great. end the call right now and uh, to announce our next coming together probably tomorrow for the 39th reading of this wonderful book from Albert Close, The Divine Program of the World's History. Great, Yerk. Thank you very much. God bless everybody and bye-bye for now. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do ye think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep, that your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? Go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow, we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. For as ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rust of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. 